In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'm not going to talk about today's Gospel reading, because I've talked about it many years, even though it's a very important one. But I want to talk about Archangels and Angels. November 8th on our calendar is the Feast of Archangel Michael and Gabriel. For those of you who follow the Julian calendar, of course, it's 13 days later. But I would like to say a few words about the angelic powers, because it's the invisible world that's very, very important from the beginning in God's creation. The love of Almighty God is a quality which is externalized through creation. The creation from non-existence of both the invisible world, that of the angels, and the creation of the material and visible universe. The culmination of the whole creative love of God was expressed with the formation of human beings as the final part of creation. And finally, with the salvation of humankind in Christ. But the world of the angels was the first creative act of God. The holy angels are what, in Greek, they call noetic creations. They're mental creations. They don't have matter. They're, they exist in the mental sphere, in the spiritual sphere. They're immaterial spirits which are forever in motion. Angels were created by God as free and independent spirits. They had the choice to remain firmly in their holiness in which they were created, or turn to wickedness, as was the case with Lucifer, who conceived evil, and with all those angels who followed him and fell. The angels are bodiless, they have no flesh, and they serve God, ceaselessly praising his sanctity and his limitless power. God created angels in the beginning to be immortal, and strangers to both corruption and death. They are, however, like human beings, capable of change, as regards their nature and their outlook. That is, they have the ability to alter their nature and to make the leap from good to evil. They take their glory and brightness from God. Angels are what they call theologically are circumscribed. That is, they aren't able to be everywhere at once. They have limits. They are not able to be everywhere at once, as is the case of God. And according to the sacred tradition of the church, angels are separated into three classes and nine celestial orders or ranks. The first class contains the six-winged seraphim, which you see in these windows above me and here on flanking the cross on three sides of the chapel and the many-eyed cherubim in what they call the thrones in Scripture. The second was, has the dominions, the strongholds, and the powers. And the third class consists of the principalities, the archangels, and the angels. But all are part of the angelic host. And two days ago, the church celebrated the synopsis of the archangels. A synopsis means the assembly, so the assembly of all the angels that stayed faithful to God. So why do we celebrate the assembly of the archangels and all the heavenly angelic powers? Why do we celebrate this? Because when God created the angels, again, he gave them complete freedom and free will. But they had to show, however, that they were worthy of that honor by staying faithful to him. And that's why their faith was tested. When Lucifer, the first in all the ranks of angels, the most splendid, the most powerful, the most brilliant, succumbed to overweening pride and thought he could supplant God and place his own throne above that of God, he committed the great sin of pride. He revolted against God and took with him a large number of angels who with their fall were transformed from lambent angels into dark ones, from holy beings to wicked ones, to demons. When the evil angels, the demons, fell, 
all the ranks of the heavenly powers assembled. And the archangel Michael stood in their midst and cried aloud, Let us attend, let us stand aright, let us stand in the fear of God. He rallied the faithful angels. How often in the liturgy do we hear that? Let us attend, let us be attentive, let us stand aright. That's not there by accident, because we have to be watchful like the faithful angels. And that's the event that's celebrated on the feast of Archangel Michael and Gabriel and all the angelic powers. We don't celebrate the fall of the evil angels, but the convocation, the assembly of the holy ones who stayed faithful to God and who demonstrated their true and unshakable loyalty to the one true God and creator of all things. The holy angels came together to express their loyalty to their creator. And since then, they remain firm in their holiness and goodness. Today's feast of the, I mean, um, two, two days ago, the feast of the archangel reminds us of two things. First, that the angels who fell into pride lost their merit and their brightness through sin. And how much more true is this for us Orthodox Christians if we also do the same? If such an irreparable calamity should befall Lucifer because he wasn't watchful and turned to wickedness, how much more will some such catastrophe occur to us who, if we of our own volition, remain bound to sin distant from God? We should learn from the example of the angels. Society today is a constant challenge and becomes more godless every day, and we have to confess our loyalty and faithfulness to Christ, not only in our hearts, but also with our lives. And when temptation and sin presents itself, it casts its enticing snares to trap us. We have to be firm in God's virtues. We have to cry aloud in faith, let us stand aright. Let us be attentive. Let us stand in the fear of God. So that what happened to Lucifer doesn't happen to us as well. We have to resist evil every day, every hour, at every minute. Because our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but against these powers of darkness, these demons of this age. And in this engagement, we can take courage because we have the holy angels on our side, continually praying to the Lord for our salvation. St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, who lived a few centuries ago, very, very holy church father, wrote a treatise on the holy angels. And in his treatise he says, While according to the theologians, the thrones judge, the seraphim warm us, the cherubim make us wise, the principalities command, the powers work deeds, the dominions preserve things, the authorities rule the nations, the archangels are ministers of the faith, and the angels liturgize. They can't celebrate liturgy with us. And he says, how much more so the archangels Michael and Gabriel as the commanders over all the rest? Even more so do they judge us, do they warm us, do they make us wise? Even more so do they command us, work deeds for us, and preserve us? Even more so do they rule over nations, minister the faith, and con celebrate the liturgy with us? At every liturgy, during the singing of the third antiphon, which is usually the Beatitudes, but sometimes the troparium of the feast with its verses from the Psalms interspersed. The priest reads a silent prayer in the altar before the clergy exit the altar for the little entrance to the Gospel book. And in that prayer, we ask God to send angels to celebrate the liturgy <coughs> with us. There's not a liturgy that's celebrated that we don't ask God to send angels to stand around this holy table in the altar and celebrate the liturgy with us. The words of the prayer are, O Master and Lord our God, you have established the orders and hosts of angels and archangels in heaven to minister to your glory. Grant that holy angels may enter together with us and come celebrate with us so that we may glorify your goodness together. What does this mean? It means that we call these angels to come celebrate the liturgy with us 
and to worship God together with us in this chapel as in every Orthodox church in the world. At the beginning of the great entrance, as the clergy bring the offerings of bread and wine out into the nave that are to become the body and blood of Christ from the proscomedia table on the side, the table of preparation, to bring it to the holy table in the center of the altar, the people are singing, let us who mystically represent the cherubim, sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-giving trinity, let us set aside every earthly care. And at the end of the great entrance, after we make our commemorations and we come in and set the offerings of bread and wine on the holy table, the people sing that we may receive the King of all who comes invisibly escorted by armies of angels. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. In several of the Octenias in the liturgy, the deacon offers the petition for an angel of peace a faithful guide, a guardian for our souls and bodies. Let us ask of the Lord. And we all say, Grant this, O Lord, the duane for thy gospel. This is not an <coughs> angel that's here, but one we can take home with us, one that we can take to work with us, one that can ride in the car with us and be with us. It means that we are asking God to grant each of us an angel of peace to faithfully guide us and guard us, to be our guardian angel. St. John Chrysostom, the golden mouth, writing in the 4th century, said every one of us has his angel. St. Basil the Great, his good friend, said beside every believer in God sits his angel. St. Clement of Alexandria, even in the 2nd century, said even when a person prays alone, angel jo angels join him in prayer. Tertullian in the next century said Christians do not sit when they pray, when they worship. You ever wonder why we stand? He says we stand when we pray out of respect for the angel of prayer, angels of prayer that are standing right beside us. If an angel were in front of you, would you sit there lazily? No, you'd stand up. Because the angels are present, praying with us. Another Christian early, early father from the 3rd century said, angels gather close to the person who prays to be united to his prayer. It's like a magnet for angels. Moreover, each angel contemplates the face of the Father in heaven and prays with us and works for us for all our needs. Angels especially gather around martyrs and those who suffer for the Orthodox Christian faith. St. Gregory of Nyssa in the 4th century said, the angels hover and wait for the death of martyrs so they can lead their souls to their place in heaven. St. John Chrysostom says the angels surround the martyrs on their way to God and they accompany them to the Holy of Holies where the Holy Trinity is in the midst of the cherubim and the seraphim, the highest of the angelic ranks. So now you know what it means when we say that the Holy Mother of God is more honorable than the cherubim and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim. Those are the two highest ranks of angels, and yet she was more glorious and more honorable than them because whereas they surround God praising Him, God dwelt within her, within her womb and took flesh from Him and from her. Therefore, let us honor the holy archangels, the angels, the martyrs, and all the other saints who have pleased God from the beginning. And may they pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.